you're here because you are really interested in developments in data science, in using machine learning, AI, algorithms, and data to try and drive better product experiences. Maybe you've started to see things that are concerning you and you just want to learn a little bit more. Or maybe you're coming along because actually you want to understand what does this mean for me personally? Where should I try and focus? What should I try and do? There's a range of different reasons that might bring you into this room. What we'll try and do in the talk I'm about to give is try and deal with some of those things that might be going through your minds. I know there's no Q&A at the end of this, but as I walk out, if there's anything that I don't cover and you want to grab me, grab me. If you want to email me, you can email me afterwards as well. My email's up there. But just before we dive in, just to understand who's in the room, how many people in the room would classify themselves as sort of C-suite? So CEO, C CFO, CTO, somebody who is a decision maker. Put your hands up if you are. OK, one or two. How many people are within the data science community? So data scientists, OK, vast majority. How many are sort of data engineering? So you're not doing the development of the models, but you're trying to set up the pipelines in the infrastructure. P put your hands up. Both. Okay, cool. Oh, that's really good. How many people sit in product or marketing? Or okay, great. How many people sit in compliance? Data protection officer, one or two of you. Okay, cool. I feel your pain, guys. Okay. So, and how many people actually know what the Information Commissioner's Office is? That's who I work for. Put your hands up. Okay, about half the room. All right. So, the U Information Commissioner's Office is an actual person. It's Elizabeth Denham. She's the commissioner. And she is independent of government, and it's her job to uphold information rights. Right, so that's all of your rights, not in your corporate positions, but as citizens. And it's to uphold the rights of the tens of millions of people in the UK whose data rights matter, and to help them leverage their rights, right, to make sure that they can exercise them. That's who she represents. And the way that we do that is a couple of things. We have some sticks. So there are fines that we can issue. There are... Uh, compulsory audits that we can undertake. We can come and knock on your door and investigate. We can even, if we think there is a big enough reason to do this, issue stop notices. So there's a range of different ways that we can exercise some powers to try and influence how people's rights are being dealt with, how their data is being managed. But there's another side to this, which is more the carrot, which is how do we work with industry, with startups, with mid-sized companies, with large tech corporations to try and engineer better information rights environment for everyone, where business can succeed, where you can all make a profit, where you can all have a great time doing your jobs, but at the same time, your customers, those citizens, can be sure that their rights are protected as defined within our society, right? So UK democracy, European democracy, we've all agreed these, these are the sorts of laws that we need to adhere to. How do we make sure that actually happens? And so the Information Commissioner's Office, that's our job. The team I represent is fairly new. It's only been around for nine months, a new directorate within the ICO. I've only been at the ICO for three months, just over three months. Previously, I was at the BBC. And at the BBC, I sh I'll just mention this, because actually my ex-colleague Ben did a really amazing talk earlier on, and I sort of agreed with everything he said, and, and he and the team there are brilliant. Um, but I wanted to talk about why I left, why it's relevant to the discussion around AI, and where this story is going to take us. I had an amazing job. I really loved it. I was head of emerging technology. It was fun, right? The job was really just go and think about and explore new technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality. I majored on machine learning and data science and AI. And to try and think about how do you start to leverage some of those tools and techniques and drive those into product, build better products internally for the organization. How do you build up organizational human capacity in understanding what's going on? But also, it being the BBC, Th and basically echoing what Ben said earlier, think about what this means for members of the public, the audience, right? So it was a fun, fun job. Why leave? One of the reasons was that I had this little worm in my head that was just, you know, burrowing away, this un unanswered question, which is, how are we going to take all of these conversations that have been happening over the last three years around ethics and responsibility, around the fact that we are all against bias, we don't want to see bias, we don't want to see people discriminated against, we want to make sure that we're being responsible, we want to make sure that the development of machine learning isn't held back by some of these issues. I wasn't sure how you could take those conversations that were happening at quite an ephemeral philosophical level around principles and values and uh, this thing called ethics and actually productionize them. You know, bring it down into the practical reality of developing models, using those models in a product context, trying to ship those. And at the same time, how do you make sure that what you are building, even if you've done a great job, is good for society overall? Right? We want to live in a healthy society. And it's really important we crack that problem 
because the potential in machine learning and AI is massive. So, you know, I could have picked a few different sort of indicators of this, right? I could have put up a stat from McKinsey or Deloitte or PwC that said global GDP is going to be massively improved by the developments in machine learning and AI over the next decade or two decades or three decades. Pick your report, pick your stat, right? It's all saying there's going to be a huge impact, it can be massive. Or look at these sorts of developments where some of these techniques, probabilistic compute techniques, have been used to really improve the degree to which we can make a difference to people's lives, real differences. You know, whether it's cancer detection, whether it's actually helping you just navigate around the city better if you're using City Mapper here in London or some other app. All of these different techniques offer a huge amount of utility and public service good and benefit for society. It's great. And yet, if you haven't been living under a stone, and as a group, because you're in this room, you haven't, you've self-selected to be here, you'll know that there is also a feeling that what is going on right now is causing a whole bunch of harm. Right? So credit to Dilbert. Dilbert is my sort of philosophical guide to life. Um, but do you at least, even if you don't believe that's true, even if you believe it's a bit hyperbolic, I mean, it's a cartoon after all, right? It's bound to be. But can you recognize that actually that's a conversation that's been happening out in the wider world, right? Through the media, through sorts of discussions, the discussions that have been happening with policymakers and others. It is happening. And there are instances where real harm is happening. There are instances where there is evidence about the use of machine learning, probabilistic compute, personal data is driving harm. How do you respond to that, right? So the Information Commissioner's Office is a regulator. It's our job to regulate information rights. We have to try and understand what to do about this, but equally, so do all of you. If you want healthy businesses, if you want to try and succeed, so whether you're a data scientist or a data engineer, whether you're compliance, whether you're in your leadership, if you're working for an organization, you want it to do well, right? And if you're not careful, at best, you end up with headlines like this, right? So the sneaky ways that companies manipulate you to buy more online. I'm sure most organizations would say, who are using sort of data science to drive their products, that's not the intention, that's not what we do. This is a misrepresentation of what happens. Actually, we're building recommenders, or we're building pricing models, or we're trying to engineer a better product experience. So if I want to go and buy some Nike trainers, I want to be able to get to the types of Nike trainers I want really quickly. I want to get rid of all of the other noise. Having some information about me, building a classifier around the sorts of things I'm interested in would be really good. Hey, that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to manipulate you through your online experiences. But it's not just retail, is it? It's also banking, it's also the media. There's lots of different sectors that would equally say, this isn't our intention. So at best, right now, if you're lucky, this is the level of headline. Actually, if you've been more egregious, if there has been an actual harm, if you've had an issue, at worst, you're going to end up with headlines like this. So this is Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. No need to go into the details. You all know what happened there. But this is the sort of headline that really erodes trust in your brand and what you're doing. And also your role as individuals who are data scientists and part of this community in those organizations. It limits your ability to do what you want to do and need to do. It limits your ability to engineer and innovate, right? So you need to avoid, we all need to avoid something like this. At the time, I mean, like I said, I've only been in the ICO three months. So this is um, a, a case that my colleagues investigated. And at the time, the limit was half a million that the ICO could find um, to any organization. With GDPR, those, that's changed. It's 4% of your global revenue. Like I said, there's compulsory audits that can be done. Stop notices can be issued, right? So the range of powers that can be leveraged have increased. I mean, the world doesn't stop, right? So equally, as, our, as the powers of the regulators have increased, the ability of organizations to move around those and respond has also increased. So there's a constant conversation about what effective regulation is, but no matter what you think about that, whether you think organizations can price themselves out of these sorts of issues or not, just reflect on this. This has material consequence, right? So it affects your recruitment ability, it affects your ability to retain talent, it has loads of consequences amongst your customer base, how they perceive your brand, and the degree to which they'll trust you, right? There's research that's recently been published that evidences that. And then why AI, just to sort of labor the point, if you were to ask me what does my current team spend all of its time on. There are, these are the list of sort of things that are priorities for us right, right now. So cybersecurity, uh, thinking about how do you design online services, design online services that work for children, right? How do you put, build in the right protections, especially when so much is data driven? How do you make sure that the role of facial recognition technology in our society is balanced against our social norms and what the law says? These are questions that we're all, we're tackling right now, we're investigating and looking into. 
And the thing is, I mean, at this point, I wish I had that Intel chime, you know, like Intel inside, right? If you remember it from the 90s or whatever. It's all AI inside. Right? Actually, AI is a really, really loose definition. It's a collection of compute technologies that might be on the one hand of the spectrum, just quite simple decision trees. On the other hand, deep learning models. But if most of these issues that we're investigating and looking into rely on personal data and they rely on some level of probabilistic compute. So AI in its general sense is powering so much of what we're seeing around us. And that makes it really important for us to understand how do we respond. So uh, we've just issued uh, a code. You can go onto the ICO's website. And really, it's saying that for any service that might be likely to be accessed by a child, here are 16 prim principles that should dictate how that experience should be delivered to that child. Right? So it's really starting to ask that question and answer it around, how do you make sure that the internet is a safe place for children to navigate? Rather than exclude kids and block them off the internet, how do we make sure that actually, if it's very likely a child is going to access your services, you've thought about them? Right? So you can go on the website and look up age-appropriate design code, just Google it or Bing it or whatever, pick your search engine, and you should be able to find more details on that. But we can't be in this room and not mention that word ethics. Right? It's singularly the most easy thing to define and the most difficult. Right? You've had countless definitions of it today, not just in this room, but across the conference today. In lots of the different rooms, people have sort of referred to it and given you some form of a definition. Again, you could Google, Google this and just ask the interweb, what is the definition for ethics? You could actually go to Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and others, and they've done lots of work on this. You've heard other organizations talk about it. So why don't I just pollute the data set and give you one more definition? Right? This is my personal one. AI ethics, for me, is the gap between what the technology enables us to do and what the law and society believes is the right thing to do. Right? So how do we navigate those two points on the spectrum? Actually, if we're being a bit more precise, that's not an accurate definition, because what the law says and what society expects are often not the same thing. Right? So actually, a, maybe a better definition is the gap between what the technology enables to do. You know, there's a point where this is all magic, but actually, what's it going to allow us to do? We all get really excited. The hype sort of increases, but there's some power to it. What the law allows us to do, you know, that simple question, is what we are building, is what I'm building and working on legal? Right? Is it legal under the GDPR? Is it legal under the Equality Act? Is it legal under the Human Rights Act? Is it legal under the different frameworks that you might be legislated under. So if you're in FinTech, what does the FCA say about what we're doing? Right? There's lots of regulation out there. How do you go about checking that? I care about personal data, so is it legal under what the legislation that the ICO has mandate for? And then finally, as a society, what do we think we ought to do? You know, is this moral? Does this fit with my personal values and principles? Does it fit the, with the values and principles of my organization? As a community, are we all heading in the right direction? So is it moral? My team's job, and I apologize for the so like not so subtle transition to cl close the gap between those things, but it's really to close the gap between those discussions, right? because the world isn't static, it changes. What was morally acceptable in the United Kingdom in the 60s and 70s is, isn't acceptable now. My, I'm a second generation immigrant. Right? My parents came from Pakistan and Kashmir. Um, when I was growing up in Sheffield, they had lots of racist invective thrown at them. Right? I had it when I was younger. We do not as a society accept that as a norm, a social norm now. So social norms will change. For data scientists, that's really important because how do you cope with the fact that your customer base, your user base, the people that you are profiling or trying to deliver services to, their context is going to constantly shift. Right? At what point do you account for concept drift? Right? How will you do all of these things? These become really important. But you have to start with this sort of framework in mind, really thinking about, OK, what does the technology enable us to do? Let's separate out the hype. Let's really focus on what is possible now, and what we're aiming to, what we're going to invent. Where is that applicable? Where should we use it? Then the test. How do you make sure that what you're doing right now to be successful as a business is legal? How can you go about making sure that's the correct thing to do? And I'll, I'll explain the AI audit framework that we've got that should help you with that. But then finally, you know, my team's job also to shape the next debate. But all of you are also shaping the next debate just in your day-to-day -day -day jobs. So how do you do that in a way that you communicate it, both for this group, but wider society? We, we kind of need to think through what the mechanisms for the, us to do that together. Now, just to focus on that middle one, what does the law say? We shouldn't shy away from a central fact. There are tensions between what the law says should be done versus the way that 
the development of machine learning, probabilistic compute is currently going, right? Some of the vogues. So I'll just run through some of these, right? So the law says minimize the amount of data that you collect and make sure you're accurate. And yet, so much of the innovation and the impact that we've seen happen over the last few years has really relied on gathering as much data as possible. Right? It's in direct tension. We have to try and square that off and figure out what do we do about it. The law says be really clear and purposeful about the information that you've gathered, personal data, and what you're going to use it for. Purpose limitation. Try and be really clear about that. Well, we also know that often the data that you collect, the example there is about crash logs, but it could be anything, when combined with other data, can help you draw inferences, right? detect patterns. Right, so how do you square off the fact that you might have got consent under a very particular use case, and you've limited the purpose in asking the, whoever your data subject is? But equally, for you as a data science team, you want that slight more freedom to be able to navigate through this and draw out inferences and detect patterns that are, are there to be detected. Right? How do you square that off? That's a tension. Right? Just recognize that legally that is a tension. You might be on the wrong side of the law if you're not careful. Uh, transparency and fairness, lots of discussion about that. Um, how do you actually make sure that the sorts of information that you provide is impactful and meaningful to whoever it is that you're explaining? That I don't want to go too far into that because it's been dis discussed quite a lot today. But alongside that, for us, as the regulator, did you recognize the context in which you were delivering that assessment? Right. How did you manage the trade-offs that you almost inevitably will have to manage in delivering that transparency or that accuracy or that understanding or that explainability? What are you willing to trade and did you do it consciously? What the law says is that actually you need to make sure that you are transparent and that you're fair in your explanations and you've done that. But we know that if you're on the deep learning end of the spectrum, actually that might be a challenge if you're just trying to explain what the model does. Right? Even data scientists and others, practitioners, would struggle with that. So actually what is useful in that context? And then Automated decision making. Lots has been made about the clauses in the law in GDPR around automated decision making. And actually, one of the ways that, one of the better ways is that to have a human in the loop. Again, up until three, four months ago, I was in media and tech. I really cared about how do you build decision support tooling for members of staff and colleagues, right? That's the language I use, decision support tools. At what point does that decision support tool become meaningless and really the person is just a token person? in that cycle, in that equation. If we determine that they were just a token person, that would work against the organization that was really saying, actually, we had a human in the loop. So one of the things that we're really interested in is actually what does having a meaningful human in the loop actually mean? How do you deal with decision fatigue of the sorts of people who might be involved in that loop to do some of that governance and those checks and balances? Right? How do you navigate this tension? And I'm going to stop making you feel uncomfortable about all of the issues that come from what a regulator could do after one more slide, and then we'll get onto the good stuff. But there are two scenarios here. Right, scenario one on the, on the left is my colleagues at the ICO come and investigate you. Right, this is a picture from the Cambridge Analytica. They had the FBI-style windbreakers. I did actually ask when I joined, can I get one as part of my sort of, uh, onboarding package? They went, no, you can't. But I'm not enforcement, I'm not investigations, but at some point, if my colleagues feel there is an issue and they come knocking on your door, that's bad, right? It's a collective failure if we all get to that point. The other side is, well, actually, how do we move the conversation and we try and engineer and create the blueprint for what a effective framework for developing machine learning is that recognizes and protects citizens' rights while at the same time allows business to innovate. So give you a snapshot of the framework. There are two parts to it. The part in green, if you are an organization of any size, should not feel unfamiliar to you, right? The exact terminology might be different, but how are you planning to deli deliver training to the people who really need to, need to know about this stuff? Right? What is leadership doing around risk management and understanding the decisions they're making? How do you, as a data science community, make sure that you're not held holding the baby because everyone else has just pushed the decision down to you? How do you make sure that it works upwards and downwards? How do you make sure that your auditing and documentation is up to scratch? We're not saying you need to develop brand new processes for this. Our work is exploring what the difference is within an AI context that you need to understand, and how do you go about understanding it and adapting and upgrading what you have. The reason is, I should have said this actually, this framework is being designed to help my assurance and investigations colleagues. 
so that the next time they have to go and investigate an organization that is using any form of data, personal data, or, or uh, probabilistic compute, AI, machine learning, what additional tools do they need to augment what they already have? Well, just as I was saying on the previous slide, we don't want to just keep that in-house. We're open sourcing this. So me sharing this framework with you at top level is step one, but there is a whole site that you can go to and you can read more about our work. We'll be issuing guidance. We're asking for consultation. We are doing this open source because we think if we raise as a community the bar, it's better for everyone. You, we go upstream, you all avoid the problem in the first place. My colleagues never, you know, don't have a job to do. Right? That's the ideal scenario for us that we don't need to investigate. But yeah, just back to this top level, really is the delta between what you already have and what is specific around machine learning and AI. The bottom half really starts to explore specific risk areas associated with AI. And here's the sorts of conversations and questions that you've had this morning. How do you untackle those, right? Let's get, if you've been relying on, say, checklists, how do you understand, how can you be sure that the checklist model that you're applying is going to get you through the legal compliance checks that you need? There were early lectures and talks about synthetic data. If you intend to use synthetic data, how can you be sure that use of synthetic data is still not going to leave you in a legal gap somewhere? How are you going to navigate that? And these, each of, this is the bottom half of the framework, just reiterated and expanded. Here are the sorts of questions that we are going away and doing some research. My colleague Ruben Bins, Dr. Ruben Bins, his day job's in Oxford Computer Science Department. He's seconded into the ICO for two years. He's developing the framework. He's doing a lot of this research. He's sharing it. He's blogging it. So if you want to know what our current thinking was around uh, automated decision making, we've got a blog out there which previews some of our thinking. You can come and get engaged. If you had a question around how do I balance the trade-off between accuracy and privacy, or accuracy and uh, explainability, some of my colleagues did a project where we used uh, citizen juries to ask people what did they care about. And I'll preview a, a little result for you. In the health context, when they were asked, would you trade away explainability of how this decision was made for accuracy, the answer was yes. Because they felt that having accuracy in a health scenario, say the cancer detection, for example, was really important. And they trusted the institutions that do that, right? So they trusted the doctors, they trusted the hospital, they trusted the NHS. Same sort of question, but presented in a police or judicial scenario. Actually, they were not willing to trade away explainability. They felt it was much more important to have an understanding of how that decision was made, because either it was going to affect them personally, or it could affect society more broadly, and they felt it was more important as citizens that they had understanding. The reason that matters to you is trying to figure out how do you navigate all of this is going to be very context-specific, and you need to know what we think when we look at this question. And we will be using this sort of approach to try and determine, did you get the balance right? right? Try and take away some of the myth and the mystique around this. We can't make it a hard science, but can we get rid of as much of the gray for you so that you understand, are we doing the right things? We've also been doing lots of work around the different rights and how they might get impacted. The next blog that's going to be issued is going to look at tr the other trade-offs and really expand on that. And really, this is leading to my, my closing slide, which is where next for this work? Because what I've shown you is just a very top level. The blogs, half a dozen that we've already published, are just our initial preview thinking. We are going to work through all of these questions over this coming period. And actually, this is your opportunity. Right? This is not being done broadcast out to you. We're not just doing this in isolation and pushing it out. This is a consultation period. This is where, if you have opinions, you can either just post them on the comment section on the website, or if you don't want to do it in public, you can email us and we can have a bilateral conversation about your views. And we're really interested to think, see what you think about the maturity of the framework. One example, what's missing off that right now is, well, if I'm not a Google or a Facebook or an Apple or a Microsoft or an IBM, the full stack problem, and I'm likely to be using third party data or third party models, what does that mean for me, right? What does it mean if machine learning is part of my supply chain? How do I, what, if it, what does it mean for me if I'm using third party dependencies to build my product? So we're going to go and research and explore that and try and provide some guidance and clarification on that. So this is your opportunity to feed in those sorts of really top burning issues that you've got, and we will try and respond. And that's gonna carry on through till about October. We'll then go into a slightly more formal consultation period towards the end of this year. And then early next year, we'll publish the actual guidance. I'll stop there because I think I'm well out of time, but if you want to go and fi find out more, you can go to this website. If you want to email us, you can use that email address. Thank you.